Klar. So can you hear can you hear me? I hear you. Uh Marilyn, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Very good. Okay. Hello everyone. Welcome uh, for joining us for today's AIWA Los Angeles Las Vegas section, uh, each section meeting uh, October 2nd. We, today we have an exciting topic and people have been waiting for a long time, has a very distinguished speaker and a leader uh, in, the, uh, in this field. So uh, we'll know more about space policy as well as the Axiom space, uh, which Dr. Marilyn uh, Dithmar has been leading uh, for a great bright future. So before that, we have a few logistics to go through. First of all, thank you very much for our AWA National Headquarters for writing this uh, wonderful Zoom platform, very expensive, and uh, for their great support, Dan Dunbarker and everyone. And uh, the, thanks to the speaker and XM Space, this session is being recorded. It will be posted uh, after the event and uh, uh, everyone will receive a, a email for the links. And uh, so if you have issue with your bandwidth of internet, you can, you're welcome to use the internet for the, uh, uh, the video, uh, but use the phone connection for the audio. That will give you the stability. And AWA is a national and actually also an international organization. You can see in this picture, we have different uh, regions, multi, um, uh, sections. Los Angeles, Las Vegas section is in the region Six in the western uh, Pacific, uh, in the, the Pacific area, in the west of U.S. And uh, the president right now is Mr. Basil Hassan, uh, executive director, Mr. Dan Dunbarker. Our uh, Los Angeles Las Vegas section section chair is Dr. Jeff Bushell. He's an AIW fellow. He's the Eurasian uh, uh, chief scientist and uh, also a Eurasian fellow as well. So. Uh, well, you probably know a little bit more about AIWA, but just very quickly, it was uh, merged from two distinguished organizations in the early 1960s, uh, one founded by the Wright brothers, the other one founded by uh, Robert Goddard. So it, overall, it's 90 plus years of aerospace leadership and uh, with many companies across many countries as well, headquartered in Western Virginia. So why do we want to join the professional society? Give you you know, connection, networking, uh, no matter what you are looking into, business opportunity, career opportunity, mentor, as look great for your um, um, resume as well. So we have different level of membership. Uh, the young professional should actually be called early career uh, because they are actually still professional. They are now students. And we are running 50% off for the young professional, uh, early career professional. They are under 35 years old and above college, university. And uh, we also have the new high school membership. The educator is free. And uh, you can see online, there are great resources. Just go to aiwa.org uh, slash membership or slash join. You will see those uh, uh, information here, easy to join. And uh, once you join the membership, you have uh, immediately you can sign in or engage. You can chat and post your information and connect with uh, worldwide AIWA members and the expert in aerospace. And, um, Daily, you receive inside, insider story from our AWA headquarters. It's called the daily launch. Some people got business, you know, uh, from this email. So it's very useful and important. And of course, uh, the very uh, prestige AWA Aerospace America is a monthly per periodical, uh, very exciting, very well uh, published and edited. And uh, if you're a member, that's, uh, you got a lot of incentives, including uh, great discount for attending AWA national conferences and forums. And uh, AWA, AWA published, so we have a lot of journal publication and we have education uh, like AWA Foundation. So AWA just received $1 million from Blue Origin for the Club of the Future. And uh, we have also in, in industry guide. And uh, if you're looking for uh, advancing your career, we have great career center as well. Um, Another great feature and, and uh, more, uh, you know, incentive for joining AWA is that you can advance your level, your ranks among AWA. So you can see there are different levels. 
And, uh, you, you know, for you can reach to associate fellow like our speaker today, distinguished speaker today, Dr. Marilyn Dismar, and uh, also Mr. Elon Musk and Mr. George Whiteside, or associate fellow and our former section chair, Dr. Rob, uh, Mr. Robert Friend in Boeing. And uh, Dr. Jeff Michelle is at our fellow, and we have uh, Ms. Mary Lee Wheaton from Aerospace Corporation, um, Mr. Steve Izakovich, the president of Aerospace Corporation, and many more. And we have honorary fellow like Buzz Aldrin uh, and uh, our beloved uh, uh, Gerst, Bill Gerstenmeier, Dr. Bill Gerstenmeier. So these are the, the you, you can advance your ranks. That's very important feature for AIAA. And we have honors and awards, and you can see Dr. Paul Belavacqua and uh, Dr. Um, I think this is Honda Press CEO, uh, this is uh, Dr. Fujino, got the read award. So a lot of great things for AWA waiting for you to discover. And student membership, you can student join the regional annual student paper conferences, design, build, and fly rocket contest. And uh, you, you have to be an AWA uh, student member you have to apply this great student scholarship. And of course, the forums, the Ascend, which is uh, supposed to replace the former flagship AWA event space conference, now it's called Ascend and with more new features. So please follow up. It's in November in Las Vegas. And many online uh, other national events, please, it's very important. Uh, these are the five flagship events for national uh, levels. So uh, just a few quick words for uh, Southern California. We are blessed. Uh, that this area has so many aerospace activities, you know, uh, heritage as well, with great history. You know, uh, of course, right now we have many exciting things going on, like a JPL, a Northrop Grumman for James, James Webb Space Telescope, and uh, we have Defense, SpaceX, Aerospace Corporation, Virgin Orbit. Um, then we also have new companies, Launcher Space, Relativity Space, more 3D, and also the, uh, you know, racing just changed their names. And of course, LJ Rocketdyne, Honeywell, and the Ampere for electric hybrid aircraft, you know, that's just amazing. And uh, we keep doing events, so keep people uh, networking and engage with AIWA. All our events are networking events. And we also have newsletter opportunity. Uh, this is the September newsletter. So you have some a great story, photo, uh, you can post there. You know, uh, you know, people know more about you, your organization, and uh, connect uh, people together. That's what ALWA is trying to do. Uh, so, so we also post the video on YouTube and our website, and also we have podcasts. So, you know, um, really, you know, with the, all those would uh, would not be possible without the support uh, of the uh, great ALWA members and great speakers like uh, well, our. Uh, uh, distinguished speaker today, Dr. Marilyn Dittmar. Uh, she's uh, executive director, vice, uh, I'm sorry, executive vice president of Exim Space. Uh, she will tell you more about herself and exactly uh, uh, exactly what Exim Space is doing. But basically, uh, this Exim Space is building the world's first commercial space station. Uh, she oversees Axiom's activity pertaining to the uh, legislative and regulatory affairs as well as international relations. Uh, an internationally known expert in human space exploration, beginning with her work on the International Space Station. In 2015, she founded and served for over five years as the first CEO of the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration, and, uh, which is an industry group supporting NASA's programs in deep space exploration and science. Uh, as a recognized influencer of national space policy, uh, Marilyn is a fellow of the National Research Society Sigma Hi, and uh, <clears throat> Associate Fellow of AIWA. She served from 2012 to 2014 uh, on the Human Space Park Committee of the National Research Council, and uh, recently completed a six-year appointment to the Space Studies Forum at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Currently, she served on the U.S. National Space Council User Advisory Group and the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee where she advised the Federal Aviation, Aviation Administration. Um, Marilyn enjoys the outdoor activity outdoors near her home in North Carolina and uh, travels frequently to Washington, DC and uh, to Exim Space Headquarters in Houston, Texas. Uh, so without further ado, that's uh, greatly, warmly, well, heartily welcome uh, Dr. Dietmar. 
So thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Which, and I'm gonna actually introduce you to my cat. This is Big Red here. <laughs> Hang on one second. I hear you. Everybody else does too. Okay, buddy. All right. Um, so first of all, thanks everybody for um, for being here today. I'm actually, I may, uh, hang on one second. I may take myself out so we're not subjected to the cat all the time. There we go. So, um, so thank you everybody for joining today. I'm really looking forward to uh, having a opportunity to share with you a little bit about space policy and also to talk to you some about what Axiom Space is doing. Um, just a word about me, we already got probably too much words about me, but um, just quickly, uh, this is also by way of apology for me. Um, when I do an introduction to space policy, there's so much content in space policy. I mean, it, you can do an, you can do an entire course on it, of course. And so what this is really gonna do is just sort of skip over the surface in a way, just to give you an introduction to it. Um, but these are some of my experiences um, in, in aerospace. It's been a, I've had a wonderful career um, and had many, many opportunities. But the thing I really kinda emphasize on the side is that um, because I've been engaged on basically supporting government programs and programs of record at NASA, as well as sort of whole of government view from the National Space Council and um, support of commercial space transportation through the FAA and support of um, the nation's science programs in space through the National Academies. Um, I've had a really unique opportunity to kind of look at space policy from several different vantage points, as well as sort of a higher level vantage point. And um, that's been very helpful to me to kind of think about how to integrate um, thinking about space policy and also have a better understanding. And I'm just grateful for the opportunities to do that, which I'm going to try and share a little bit with you today. But I'm also not going to be able to delve into all of this because there just isn't enough time. So with apologies, I'm going to give short shrift to space science and how that policy is developed um, and sort of the nuts and bolts of how policy is developed at advisory level groups um, or committees. And I'll just offer um, to speak with you about any of these things once we get to Q&A or discussion, I'd be happy to do that. The last thing I do wanna say is the opinions that I express here today are solely mine and not those of my employer Axiom Space. So this sort of typical caveat. And the next slide, oops. So what is space policy and why do we care? Um, that, that's a great question and it's one I get a lot. Um, when I was working as an engineer um, at, at Boeing and then a manager for engineering at Boeing, I had very much the same question. Um, and some days I still have the same question, um, but space policy is an articulation of the nation's goals in space and the means by which we're gonna achieve those goals. The national space policy, which is a document itself, together with executive orders, laws, and regulations are broadly considered to be part of space policy for the US. And so space policy is not contained in a single document. It is also not contained in a single Congress or a single administration. Um, it's a body of thought and documentation and regulation and law um, that evolve over time. So why do we need it? Well, basically um, it helps to provide direction to government agencies and departments um, it defines frameworks for relationships with industry and educational sectors. Um, it articulates national security, civil, commercial, and scientific equities and activities, and it clarifies intent. And that last piece about clarifying intent is very, very important. Um, so it clarifies intent both for, um, for, other, for the government, but also for the public, um, for other um, other countries, okay, for non-government organizations, for industry, et cetera. So it is very much um, a communications effort. With regard to international law, um, and this, I am aware certainly of space policy law, but it, it is not my area of expertise. So I'm going to pay search shift to it too. But I just want to point out. The US space policy also provides legal communities with guidance as to how the US will interpret or create legal frameworks and solutions. And that can come from lots of different areas. It can come from Congress, it can come from the executive branch, 
Um, it can come from um, uh, other entities inside the US government. Um, so usually it's expressed through law, but not always. And so these, um, these policies and these frameworks for intent may shift across administrations and Congresses, although most try to build upon existing policy and law, not always, okay, but they try to build upon existing policy and law. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is there's a general understanding of the importance of continuity across Congress's and administrations and over time on the part of the US. Um, but the other part of that is that if you start to communicate changes in space policy that are going to upend international law, um, you're, you're really opening up a can of worms <laughs> um, because international law pertaining to space has more than a 50 year history. Um, it's more than just uh, outer space treaty or moon treaty. It's the entire body of law that's actually an understandings and treaties that have grown up around that. And so um, it's, it, 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 although it's not easy to evolve space policy and international law, it's probably easier to do that um, than to upend all of it. So just as an example of how we, we can see um, space policy evolve, this is just a little snippet from space policy documents issued by three different administrations, President George W. Bush, President Obama and President Trump. And I'm just gonna sort of lay out the, I'll, I'm gonna read all of these to you, but basically the, the Bush administration's position, this has to do with national security. The United States will oppose the development of new legal regimes or other restrictions that seek to prohibit or limit US access to or use of space. It was a blanket statement. Um, and essentially what it was saying was, we simply won't accept um, any restriction on our activities. Um, the second, which is sort of um, the parallel that came from the Obama administration was the US will consider proposals and concepts for arms control measures if they're equitable, effectively verifiable and enhance the national security of the United States and its allies. So where Bush was saying blanket statement, we're gonna oppose any restriction. The Obama administration was saying, we'll consider proposals for arms control, but it has to meet these criteria. And then the Trump administration, which is our current space policy, because it was issued in 2020, and the Biden administration has not yet issued a new national space policy, um, is recognizing the right of nations to explore and use outer space. The United States will continue to use space for the security of our nation and our allies. Should any adversary threaten to endanger the benefits we all derive from space, the United States will employ all elements of national power to deter and, if necessary, prevail over hostile activities in, from, and through space. So what this does um, is it actually sort of tries to, it's actually trying to sort of thread the needle between the, the two previous administrations. The first one saying, you know, blanket statement, we're gonna oppose any legal regime that restricts us at all. The second one saying, we'll consider looking at arms control measures, but we have to meet certain criteria. Um, and the third one saying, you know, we'll continue to use space for our benefit, for the benefit of our allies. And so it's communicating that we recognize that we have allies. However, all right, if we're challenged, all right, then these are the measures that we're gonna take. So these, it, it's really difficult to sort of pick and choose from an entire national space policy document because each one of these administrations issued a document and that document has uh, concepts and um, points in it that express national security issues all through the document. But this is just an example of sort of how you see these things kind of evolve and change over time. So let me talk a little bit about um, who, who does space policy, you know, where, where does it come from? Um, and it comes primarily from two sources, but not only those sources. So the executive office of the president, um, and these are just some of the the offices that you see underneath that, that office. All of these um, offices play into discussions about space policy and its implementation. Um, some of them through executing their functions. So for example, the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, okay, actually directs, for example, NASA, not just NASA, but other agencies, okay, by essentially assigning them budgetary, um, budgetary uh, uh, allocations to various programs. Um, and in so doing, exercise policy. And there's a lot of debate in the government about that, actually. Office of Science and Technology Policy, okay, will issue science and technology policies that can reach across a variety of different agencies insofar as how they're going to implement space policy. The National Space Council um, is, has been, had an on and off history 
Um, it was uh, reinstituted by President Trump and includes many cabinet members. So it's at the it's sort of at the cabinet level. And the purpose of it is to provide a quote, whole of government, close quote, approach to looking at United States space policy, the National Security Council, which is more concerned with national intelligence and national security issues having to do with space, and then DOD and I, um, which is focus um, exclusively on national security issues. And then under that, okay, under the executive branch also, we have departments and agencies, defense, state, homeland security, transportation, independent, those are, um, and then independent agencies or departments as needed. So NASA, FCC, AFAA, et cetera. And all of these are involved in space policy or in implementing it. Um, with regard to the legislative branch in Congress, okay, well, you know, there's two bodies of Congress, right? As you all know, there's the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, within the House of Representatives, what you see are essentially you can think about the committees that are engaged in space as falling into two big buckets. One of them are is the authorizers, and I'll talk a little bit more about what they do in a minute. Okay, and then the second is the Committee on Appropriations, um, and I'm just sort of laying out the subcommittees that are associated with that. Okay, uh, and there's parallel sub there's parallel committees um, that are that are also associated with, um, with the authors, authorizers. And then the Senate essentially has a, uh, a parallel structure. And so there's multiple committees, okay, was really the point I wanted to convey, multiple committees and subcommittees that are engaged in formulating space policy. And then appropriators, of course, put the dollars to the actual policy. So how does this happen? Well, there's, high level study, deliberation, discussion and consensus building um, within and across government. And consensus building is also shorthand for a lot of arguing. Um, you know, people are, uh, are basically coming from various different points of view. Um, you know, as you all know, we have a democratic government and um, was it Churchill that said that, uh, you know, US democracy is essentially this form of government is essentially um, the worst uh, form of government except for all the others. Um, it is a messy process. It's not always a, a simple process. Um, there's also advocacy and political engagement by stakeholders. Um, legislation and law formulates space policy um, and basically instantiates it and communicates it. Executive orders, which are orders that are issued by the office of the, the executive office of the president. Um, regulation, okay, that can come from legislative mandate, or it can come from agency action, or it can come, again, directed from the executive branch. State engagement, and I'm not going to spend a, ton, a lot of time here on talking about states, I'm really focusing more on federal, um, but various states certainly have equities in the space domain, depending on those states, certainly California, is already, as Ken already mentioned when he was doing the introduction, uh, has a number of equities um, having to do with space. And that's true across many other states, right? So um, depending on the engagement of the folks that are uh, in power in either state legislatures or uh, in the governor's office, states will vary in terms of how engaged they are. And they'll also vary widely in terms of how they are interacting with their federal representatives, but some states are very active. And then grassroots activity, um, which I'm sort of capturing here as citizen advocacy, AIAA, of course, has their AIAA, the day on the hill. Um, and there's a lot of other groups that do that. Citizens for Space Exploration is another one that comes to mind. Um, and this is true, of course, across all domains, not just space. Um, but that grassroots advocacy is um, can sometimes be extremely effective, uh, especially on the hill. So there's two versions of the national space policy. And, um, and I wanna differentiate between national space policy all in caps, which is what this is, or actually capitalized at the beginning of the words, I suppose, um, versus talking about space policy sort of more broadly. So here, what I'm talking about is the national space policy of the United States of America. And that is a document. Um, and that document is issued by the executive branch. Um, the national space policy together, as I mentioned before, with the executive orders, laws and regulation, make up space policy, um, sort of writ with, with small, uh, in small font. Um, there are classified and unclassified versions of the national space policy. And so uh, one of the things I need to remind people is sometimes is that when you see the national space policy that's issued, for example, this is a copy of the last one that was issued, which is the 
one that was issued by the Trump administration in December. Um, this is the public version. There is also a classified version, which is not public. Um, what they have in common is that they're both used to direct executive agencies, sort of tell them what to do. They're both intended to guide Congress to create laws that are consistent with the intent and activities that are uh, contained therein. They're both intended to signal international allies. Um, and they're both intended to provide guidance and forecasting to stakeholders. But obviously, where those stakeholders are located and what activities they're engaged in differ. Um, whereas the public version of the national space policy, which does address national security and national intelligence, um, but does so sort of at a top level, is more, um, is more focused than on science, on civil. Um, the, there is some, some, a lot growing amount of it on cyber. Um, and then those things you tend to see more in detail um, in the classified versions. The first space policy was actually issued by the um, Eisenhower administration, and it was a preliminary um, policy. And I've actually got a link to it. Um, once these slides are, are, um, are published, you can look it up because what's, what's available now has been declassified. You, you'll also see, because the original document is available at this link, um, and you'll see it marked secret, um, and then later unclassified. It was a preliminary recommendation that actually came out of the National Security Council. Um, Mark secret, it was classified. It sort of formed the basis of a eventual recommendation that was made to Eisenhower, which he then eventually signed. Um, and so that, and then, and it was accepted almost completely um, in whole. And so when you go look up that document, you can see what the initial concerns were. And it should be no surprise in 1958, um, that the majority of the focus of the document was on the US rivalry and, and um, perception of threat from the Soviet Union. Um, and so there's information there about, um, about what, what the US was assessing um, in terms of the developing Soviet uh, capabilities and recommendations about where the US needed to go in terms of adopting a posture um, to be able to deal with those. Every administration since the Eisenhower administration has issued a space policy. And all of those were classified until George H.W. Bush. Um, and since then, each administration has issued both classified and unclassified versions. So, um, so a thing just to be aware of is that, you know, you've got sort of what's called the white or the black version, or, um, you know, you've got, you've got discussions that are, are visible to the public and that are not visible to the public. And so um, the congressional deliberations in action, of course, may also be classified or unclassified. So you're all aware, you know, from watching the news about, you know, periodically you'll hear that there's been, quote, behind closed door, close quote, okay, deliberations having to do with something in space or some other um, aspect of US domestic policy. Um, those are not always, but often um, classified, classified meetings. So I want to, talk just a little bit um, about separation of powers. And I was sharing um, uh, with Ken and actually Mandu before I, before I joined with all of you that um, I've been really honored to um, sort of be named as a space policy fellow by Purdue's College of Engineering, it's the AAE group, um, as part of their CIS Lunar Initiative. And um, We've lost a lot of time there, of course, because of the pandemic, and I'm getting ready to sort of round the corner uh, and re-engage after the first of the year. Um, but when I was there uh, in 2019, I had the, um, the honor and joy, actually, of interacting with a lot of, um, of the graduate students and started to talk about um, space policy. And it became kind of obvious that I needed to talk a little bit about um, separation of powers. And so, um, for those of you that are going eye rolling right now that I can't see you going, oh my gosh, I can't believe she's doing this. Um, the reason I'm doing it is because I find that sometimes there's a lot of confusion about what is meant by, for example, an executive order by the president having to do with something to do with space policy versus um, a bill, okay, not even law, all right, but a bill um, that's being considered on the Hill having to do with space policy. And when things really get interesting is that when when these are when bills are being developed, for example, that look like they're going to be in conflict with policy perspectives from the executive branch uh, or vice versa. And so I just want to spend a minute to kind of tromp through the sort of the rules of the game, um, which are in the separation found in the separation of powers in the Constitution. 
And you've all probably heard the expression the president proposes and Congress disposes. And what's meant by that is that um, no president spends a dime that's not authorized by Congress, although many have tried. <laughs> um, and in fact, presidents uh, are um, in general, uh, really want to um, sort of utilize to the extent possible the full range of executive powers that are accorded to them under the Constitution. And so we have over 200 years, actually, of um, legal interpretation of the Constitution and how those separation of powers are actually implemented. And, uh, and some of that um, jurisprudence and some of those courses, cases have, of course, gone to the, that are at the Supreme Court, um, as well as a lot of other um, cases have actually um, have focused on sort of, well, what is meant, you know, by um, executive powers and what is meant by congressional powers. But in general, um, as you probably all remember from civics class, Congress holds the power of the purse. Okay, so, um, so basically they have the power to to authorize funding um, and expenditures on behalf of the US government. Um, but no Congress can bind a future Congress. And so what that means is that no Congress can set, whoops, I got a double negative in this expression, sorry. Um, no Congress can set legally binding budgets beyond its own term, which is, a, which is, which is two years. Um, actually, it's not supposed to do it for more than one year, but there've sort of been some ways around that. Um, now, a Congress can lay out um, budget expenditure, just like an executive can lay out budget expenditures, okay, which essentially are for planning purposes. And a Congress can authorize expenditures um, for, meaning it can say, hey, our policy is that we want to see multi-year expenditures, for example, on this program or on that program. But there is actually an appropriations limit, okay, as to how dollars can be allocated, okay, to those. And Congresses can agree. So for example, right now we're in the 117th Congress, the 118th Congress could come along and say, yeah, we agree with all of those authorizations and appropriations and that plan that was set out in the last Congress. And so we're just going to go ahead and allocate money um, that's in accord with that. So essentially the Congress is willfully signing on to budget planning that had been done in a previous, con previous Congress, but legally, okay, a Congress cannot bind a future Congress. Um, when an act of Congress enacted into law by the president's signature uses the words must, shall, or will, those directives are binding on everyone, including the president. Um, and so that has been, and that aspect of the separation of powers, okay, has, as I mentioned, um, been a source of a lot of tension, um, especially between the executive and the, and the legislative branch, and for many years on many topics. Um, so law trumps an executive order on the same subject. So this is, again, sort of part of the ground rules, right? So the national space policy that's issued by the executive um, branch cannot conflict with existing law. If it conflicts with existing law, okay, then law trumps the space policy, okay? Just like law trumps an executive order. Um, law trumps um, for example, an attempt to do regulatory overhaul that's driven by the executive branch or one of the agencies of the executive branch, if it runs afoul of existing law, okay, then basically um, it comes into conflict with it and it's not considered valid. Now, what you'll often see is that you'll have a, a tussle sometimes between the executive branch and the congressional um, folks basically saying, no, this is not consistent with law. Um, and so those cases, if there are cases that get get raised or filed, um, those end up at the Supreme Court to, to decide. If they're constitutional issues, it ends up at the Supreme Court. So the, the, um, the same by the same token, if you have a national space policy or other executive orders and you have new law, okay, that's written, um, that new law can then invalidate aspects of the executive orders or the national space policy or, or whatever else has come from the executive branch. So we have a separation of powers um, that's enshrined in the constitution for a reason. And the reason is that it forces a joint negotiation between the powers with regard to policy. It is not perfect. Um, it is often messy. It has created um, conflicts and the, the, the larger concern from the point of view of space policy when we signal, um, use it to signal to the rest of the world is that sometimes you have Congress talking down one line and you have the executive talking down another um, and that can be very confusing, as you might imagine, for our allies and very confusing also for um, foreign policy, 
powers who may not be allies. Um, and some of those foreign powers can sometimes try to use those, um, those differences as a wedge. And so in general, both the executive branch and the legislative branch recognize that, um, and they don't want that to happen, of course. And so they try to align um, over time, although sometimes it doesn't work. Um, so the point there is that like all legal frameworks, separation of powers requires good actors on all sides to respect and adhere to the separation of powers um, and to these basic ground rules, okay? And I have a note there that says federalism is the same. Um, federalism, of course, referring to the relationship of the states to the federal government, which is an entire other discussion um, that I'm not gonna get in there, but both of those, the, but all of these essentially require good actors to adhere to them. Um, and that said, even among really good actors, okay, there can be huge differences of opinion um, with regard to how you interpret things, right? The whole reason we have a Supreme Court, right, is to be able to provide guidance, okay, having to do with interpretation of the implications of the Constitution and the body of law around the Constitution. Um, because a lot of times, I mean, these are, these are all written by human beings, communication is imperfect, um, perceptions evolve, society evolves, um, and so we often need sort of a reinterpretation of those things. So the reason I'm, you know, sort of taking this little sideline chomp through the, the separation of powers here and, and appreciate all of you indulging me is because it's important to understand that space policy is developed in that context, right? Next slide. Talking to myself here. So with regard to legislation, I'm really going to just talk about two types. Um, one of them here is I already mentioned sort of authorization bills. And authorization bills, and I'm giving you an example of the last um, authorization bill that was passed uh, for NASA. Okay, there's authorization bills for all kinds of things. Um, but for NASA, the last one that was passed was the NASA Transition Authorization Act of 2017. Um, it's a vehicle, it's a bill that has become law. Okay, um, it's a vehicle, authorization bills are vehicles for setting a communication, both policy and direction. It's often directed to agencies like this one. Okay, it was essentially, uh, the 2017 bill, which became the public law when the president signed it, okay, was essentially directing NASA to execute space policy as it was laid out in the authorizing bill. Um, it's also used as a signaling bill to other entities, including, as I mentioned before, Congress, the Executive Office of the President, Foreign Powers, Regulators, et cetera. And it authorizes funding. And by that, I mean, it's intended under the regular order, and remember those words, because I'll come back to them in a minute, under the regular orders as guidance to appropriators. So essentially you got the authorizer, authorizing committees that are saying, all right, here's what we think the sense of Congress should be is, okay, with regard to space policy of the United States, let's, in this particular case with NASA, okay, and we're going to lay out, okay, what the funding profile should look like okay, for NASA. And so if you pull up this public law, okay, what you'll see is a, a bunch of buckets of money, okay, that are laid out, okay, and so it'll, it'll be one that'll sort of say, up front, there's a lot of upfront matter, which is essentially a sense of Congress, and it kind of lays out the policy direction at a high level. So for example, in human exploration, you'll see direction that talks about returning to the moon and going on through Mars, okay, by means of, you know, essentially developing government programs and capabilities that allow you to do that, making as much as possible, okay, also um, partnerships with international allies and with commercial space. Um, and so you'll see that in the 2017 Act, for example, which is an evolution of earlier acts. So it's guidance to appropriators about kind of what the authorizers are seeing. On the other hand, you get the appropriations bill, which generally the media talks about the budget bill or the budget or an omnibus bill, or sometimes they'll talk about a minibus, which is essentially appropriations that have been broken down by agencies or a group of agencies and are not a huge big budget bill for the whole government. An omnibus bill, omnibus bill is usually a bill for the entire government. Um, and it assigns funding to policy and direction. So the authorizers are saying, hey, here's the policy that we think that Congress should pursue, okay, and that the U.S. should then go implement, okay, but then the appropriators are the one that actually have the checkbook. It's a good way to think about it. So they assign the funding to that policy and direction that's in the authorizing language. It should align, theoretically, okay, with the authorization bill, but budget bills are annual, authorization bills are not, Okay, and so in fact, and sometimes the appropriators will look at what's come across to them from the authorizers and they'll say, yeah, no, we don't agree. 
And so you'll see shifts in the pot of money, okay, and the way that it's allocated, or you'll see money broken out differently. Um, so there's a bunch of different sort of approaches that appropriators might take if they're not in agreement, strict agreement with the authorizers. That said, overall, there tends to be pretty good alignment okay, between direction from the authorizers and then what's supposed to happen by the from the appropriators. Now, um, I have a link here uh, to a video that was um, actually uh, it first showed up on Schoolhouse Rock. Um, there's probably some of you in the audience that weren't born in 75. I was graduating high school. And there's some of you in the audience older than I. Um, believe it or not, but uh, I'm Just a Bill was uh, premiered in 1975, and I'm not going to show it here, but it's a, it's a great um, video, which I highly recommend you watch. I'll, I'll, I'm leaving you the link here, uh, which essentially describes how does a bill become law, right? Um, how does a bill get created, and then how does a bill become law? And generally, what happens is that bills are developed because um, any number of people, citizens, you know, literally off the street can, can develop bills. And you see that happen, right? Um, sometimes people do advocacy um, uh, and, and are actually sort of be able to build up enough of a grassroots movement that they can get bills um, up to the up to Capitol Hill. Um, you may see an individual member, okay, of Congress decide that they want to write a bill. You certainly see committees um, that develop bills. And then those bills are essentially worked out between the House and the Senate. And then once you have a consensus bill, then that goes forward to the president for signature. A bill does not become law, okay, until the president signs it. So Congress created NASA uh, via an authorization act. This was in alignment with what um, the Eisenhower administration was looking for there was a lot of discussion about how to proceed with regard to the Soviet threat and the emergence of Soviet capabilities. And Eisenhower made the decision that there needed to be a separation between military approaches and civil. And for a number of reasons that really are just deeply mired in, in what became sort of a, a larger body of space policy, um, felt that this needed to be a civil agency. And the reason was simply to try to avoid going down the path that the U.S. felt that the Russia, the that Soviets were going down, which was essentially to militarize space. And so NASA was created after a lot of discussion all through Washington, but it was actually created by Congress um, via a NASA, via the an Authorization Act, which is now known as Public Law eight five five six eight. Whenever you see Public law, 85 refers to the Congress. So this was the 85th Congress. It was the first two numbers, okay? And 568, which is, is the number of the law that was emerged. That was the 568th law, okay, that came out of the 85th Congress. So the National Aeronautics and Space Act of 1958, um, once signed into law by President Eisenhower, created NASA. And as you may have uh, noted, yesterday was actually NASA's birthday. So this is a very timely um, a discussion here. And these were the key components that were included in that 1958 act. Um, so I'm not going to read all of them. You know, most of you are probably familiar with them anyway. What's important to note is insofar as space policy is concerned, every subsequent NASA act is essentially built upon this act. So we actually refer to this act as the NASA Authorization Act as amended, National Aeronautics and Space Act of 1958 as amended. Um, it was amended actually shortly after the original act, okay? But it's continued to be amended over the last uh, decades by each authorization act. But each authorization act carries forward the acts that came before it. So we talk about the evolution of a NASA authorization act what we tend to do is we talk about the Authorization Act as, well, whichever the latest one is, and those years in which it was signed. But basically, this is all the same act. And there are people who get paid <laughs> money to go through these acts, okay, and reconcile them. Um, and so you can actually go online to, uh, to, to um, I think Thomas is the, um, where the doc is, is uh, the Thomas database is where the doc uh, is where the, um, the act is. And that's the entire Reconciled Act. Okay, that has uh, that has components going all the way back to 1958. Okay, and then all the way up through through 2017, which is the last time that we saw an authorization act. 
And I, I found this just because I thought um, you might be interested in it. Actually, I have to credit Jeff Bingham with this. Jen Jeff was the, um, the senior staff Republican for uh, Commerce on the Senate Commerce Committee uh, for many, many years um, when Kay Bailey Hutchinson was, uh, was chairwoman. And Jeff dug this up for a lecture that we did together. Um, this was the original um, initial action plan for NASA in January of 1958. So, um, considering that the NASA was created um, on September, you know, on um, October 1st of 1958, this is pretty quick work <laughs> to have an initial action plan. Of course, it, the stuff had been under discussion for a while inside the, um, the office of the president, but um, initial action plan, January 59. And what's really interesting is to kind of look at this um, because in 1958 or and 59, you know, the focus of the thinking about this was really to develop launch capabilities. And if you go back and look um, at the language um, in the act, uh, there's a lot of focus on sort of, you know, improvement of aeronautical and space vehicles, development and operation of vehicles for space flight. Of course, the reference to aeronautical vehicles is because NACA, okay, which was the precursor to NASA, was focused largely on aeronautics and it was incorporated into NASA when it was created. Um, but there's a lot of focus on sort of the development of these um, of these capabilities and 61 to 62 is attainment of manned space flight project Mercury, uh, which was already um, underway. But what's interesting is that the focus event, there's also a focus on, um, on developing uh, a capability to have a space station. So if you go down the list toward the end there um, in 65 and 67, the idea of the first launching of a program leading to manned circumlunar flight um, and a permanent near earth space station. So basically we're talking about getting human beings out um, in orbit around the moon by 65, 67 and the creation of, um, of a capability that would lead to a near earth space station. And then a, a man's man flight to the moon, then man crewed, we call human flight to the moon now um, beyond 1970. And all of this got upended, of course, uh, when Gagarin was launched. Um, and NASA was revectored to essentially an all hands on deck focus. Um, and then eventually with Kennedy's proclamation that we would, would go to the moon and the focus on, on, on beating the Russians there. So how does all this work? Um, I'm just gonna talk about human space flight again with my caveats of apologies uh, to others. Um, congressionally policy objections of pro, pro objectives have been really consistent over the last 15 years or so. I mean, remarkably so, and you can go read them yourself. So if you go back and you pull up the NASA authorization acts, they've just built upon each other starting really in 2005. Um, there's evolution before that time. And the 2005 one is not a break with the previous ones, but it does state some things pretty clearly um, that had not been stated before. So in 2005, 2008, 2010, and then 2017, that was a pretty big gap um, of, 10, of seven years between the 2010 and 2017 acts. And we've got a four year and running gap now, um, although there are authorization acts that are have been passed on the house side and there's the Senate, I just talked to them yesterday, um, are talking about an authorization act. I don't think we'll see it until sometime next year. So we may get a NASA authorization act sometime in 22. But these things really have kind of built on each other um, beginning in, in 2005, clearly. Um, there's also bipartisan bicameral support. By bicameral support, we mean both houses of Congress um, for, for NASA human spaceflight. But these margins are getting thin. Um, and, I, and I point this out to folks. Um, as you all know, um, there's tremendous pressure on discretionary budgets in the United States. And as those budgets come under greater and greater pressure, then what happens is that it gets harder and harder to justify activities in the discretionary budget because the budget that's mandatory or directed is taking up more and more of the percentage of the US budget. And so it becomes harder and harder to sort of justify some of this stuff in some quarters. And what that really means is it's harder and harder for congressional members to engage in the kinds of negotiations that are needed. Um, but I still wanna point out that um, with regard to really NASA in general, it's not just human spaceflight, um, NASA in general, there has been really remarkable um, bipartisan support. You know, you may dicker over some of the aspects of the policy. Um, there may be discussions back and forth about, you know, expenditures. Um, it's pretty predictable that, for example, Democrats are going to want more um, spending on earth science. 
Um, Republicans want more, more, um, more spending on human space exploration. Um, that has kind of been a tension that's gone back and forth, but they've been able to work that out um, over time and in general have been strongly supportive of, of, of NASA um, and also of human spaceflight, which is nice to see when you're in a situation where Congress can't seem to agree on much of anything right now. Um, the executive branch has been more variable in policy direction. So I talked about the fact that, you know, there's been about 15 years, actually 16 years now, a pretty consistent direction from Congress. I don't let anyone ever tell you Congress can't make up its mind with regard to where it's going with NASA because it's not true. Um, you can throw a lot of other um, complaints at Congress's way if you want to, which is it's authorizing and appropriating um, grossly insufficient funds um, to do for NASA to do everything that they also tell NASA that they want it to do. That's a valid criticism. Um, and you can, and it's been made many times and in many studies. Um, but if you ever hear anybody say, well, they can't make up their mind or they're all over the map with regard to that, they're really not. Just go back and look at those acts. Um, the executive branch has been more variable in policy direction. And again, I'm just talking about human spaceflight. You know, it's just a little chunk of it. Um, half the agency's budget though, so it's important. Um, the Clinton administration tended to focus on the ISS. Um, the Reagan, of course, Reagan is the one that announced the ISS, um, which was then not the ISS, it was a space station, but Clinton made it the ISS, um, the international aspect that invited the Russians in. Um, that was done for reasons that crossed policy lines, right? The, they engaged the Russians, certainly beginning in 1993, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, because what they were actually trying to do was address some of the concerns about nuclear proliferation having to do with the scientific community in the former USSR. So there's a focus on the ISS. Um, then shift to the moon, okay, with, uh, with George W. Bush. Then shift to, uh, shifting to Mars sort of as a very distant destination and a more near-term focus on developing capabilities to do an asteroid mission. Um, and then back to the moon with Trump and then um, a little bit after that, okay, um, moon to Mars, okay, when the president said, well, why aren't we, why aren't we what are we doing with Mars? Um, and now uh, we're sort of back near term to the moon with Mars as the horizon goal. And the Biden administration has been signaling that they intend to continue um, and continue that policy. And I'll tell you from the, from an insider's point of view that um, that during the previous administration, there were, a, there was a lot of reaching across the aisle. Um, both on the Hill and at the executive branch um, to engage with folks um, in sort of all sides, you know, of the political spectrum. The point being made that there was a broad recognition um, in part due to NASA's advocacy on this point, um, which I think NASA was very effective um, in, in advocating this. Um, NASA's advocacy on this point that, hey, look, every time we have a presidential um, a change in administration, we get new direction. If you go back and look over the last 20 years, okay, we've, we've kind of gone back and forth. We sort of have whiplash. And the effect of that, all right, is that it prevents US space policy and implementation in human spaceflight from going forward in a really significant way. So, hey guys, it would really be good if we could stick to one um, and have some transition across administrations. And so, so far it's been um, sort of a relief to all of us that are engaged in space policy to see that the Biden administration, insofar as they've as they've weighed in on space policy, and they haven't done much yet in human spaceflight anyway, um, they they're sort of saying, nope, let you know, let's keep going that direction. Um, the Trump administration provided the most active presidential focus on space since Kennedy. Um, people can argue that with me, but I will say all you've got to do is look at the publication record. Um, there were seven space policy directives. There were four executive orders. There were four memos slash documents on national space strategy and other policies. And then there was a new national space policy. And um, a lot of that happened because the National, the national uh, Space Council, which uh, under the, the, um, the very active um, direction of Scott Pace, who was the executive secretary, um, and the personal interest of the vice president, um, who, was, who was personally as well as um, politically engaged in space, I think we just sort of had a coming together um, of, of people and events um, that plus the, the, the continuing development of commercial space capabilities um, and the huge numbers of dollars that are beginning to be invested in commercial space. I think it all kind of came together at a moment in time that 
there was a renewed focus on space policy. Um, so I've given you a couple links there where you can go back and look at um, the first one has all of the space policy directives, the executive orders, the memos, et cetera. And then the second one um, provides you a link to the, the national space policy, that, the document that was released in December. So um, evolution of space policy, uh, government support for private or commercial spaces by far the, mo far, far the most impactful change in space policy over the last 30 years. Um, that's on the civil side, okay? On the national intelligence um, side, the classified side, there been a lot of other evolutions and events that obviously we're not gonna discuss here, but overall, um, that one is probably the most impactful change. It actually began with the, the Reagan administration. Um, where national space policy started to foster an approach that uh, engaged commercial, uh, engaged, basically encouraged government um, to engage with the capabilities that were beginning to be developed, um, both by private and public space companies. Um, and so basically since then, all administrations have built on this and they've expanded support for public private partnerships and commercial space activities side by side with government owned capabilities. Um, frequently referred to as commercial or private, these are usually public-private partnerships, not always, but it's really unusual to find um, companies that are solely funded by private or institutional investments and don't have government money in them, okay? Um, and so when you have government money, then the definition, they become public-private partnerships. These are tricky um, to develop and manage. Um, and the reason that they're tricky um, Public-private partnerships have been used on used in this planet on this planet for hundreds of years. They predate the United States, um, and so um, there. I mean, the Dutch had one, the, the English certainly had one for that went on for a couple hundred years, actually. Um, and so they've been around for a long period of time. They've been used all around the globe, for example, to develop infrastructure, terrestrial infrastructure. But what's really involved to, to kind of do these successfully is a clear understanding of the risks and the benefits and who's carrying what risks and who gains what benefits. And that's harder to do than it sounds like it is. And in space, um, we're, I think we're all dazzled by you know, seeing what Elon Musk has been able to achieve with SpaceX, but there's a lot of misinformation okay, about all of that. Um, and and uh, which, is, and which is not at all a commentary on SpaceX. Um, it's more a commentary on the media's misunderstanding, okay, of what's involved involved in that. Government oversight from a congressional point of view remains necessary where taxpayer dollars are involved. So one of the really tricky things is, hey, if I'm a company and I'm developing capabilities and I've got some government money in, does that mean I have to go to disclose to Congress all of my proprietary inventions and all of my proprietary interests, okay, and all of my business planning? Well, I mean, if I'm a company, I'm saying not just no, but hell no. Okay. If I'm Congress, I'm saying, well, yeah, but then we have a constitutionally mandated responsibility to do oversight where taxpayer dollars are concerned. So there's been a lot of give and take um, and tension, which has played out often um, in the press, okay, having to do with that over the last several years. These have generally, these companies have been really successful in driving down costs when they're servicing existing customers. So, um, so what you've seen in NASA is this sort of shift over time and not just on the human space flight side where it's been most public, but it's also happening on the science side. Um, public private partnerships, of course, on the aeronautics side have been in play in the United States for more than 70 years. So the aeronautics side on NASA basically has lots of expertise in development of, of um, public private partnerships. There, um, it's important to understand what the customer base is, right? So who's going to pay for the services or capabilities or goods that are provided under a public-private partnership? And it's important to understand that. And then the other thing to understand about public-private partnerships is as effective as they are, as valuable as they are, as useful as they are, and of course, they're not just driving down costs for the government, but they're also stimulating a broader industry, which is hugely important. Um, it's not appropriate for all applications. So there's going to be sometimes where the government's going to want to hold ownership, okay, both of development and IP and implementation, okay, having to do with larger national um, policies. And you see debates about that also kind of playing out in the press. So aspirational goal of a space economy is more accurately about utilizing space to, right, to, to advance the terrestrial economy, at least right now. 
um, we're still a long way away from a true in-space economy, right? Where goods and services are developed in space for customers in space, okay, to be used and applied in space. Um, and to have that achieve the point at which it becomes um, sort of a self-generating uh, engine, right? We're still pretty far away with that. Um, we're at the point now where we're beginning to utilize space for development of, of terrestrial applications. And you see a lot of that discussion, for example, with regard to the International Space Station, which has been, we talk about commercializing it, and I'm certainly going to get to that in a minute with regard to Axiom, um, but essentially generating a portfolio of customers that can provide enough revenue. Um, those customers that are using, okay, are still really interested largely in terrestrial applications. But there are some early concepts um, for uh, commodities markets um, that are being discussed. And a lot of those are being driven by talking about resources that are available in space. So um, I've got a link here to a white paper, which was not an official publication of the user's advisory group for the National Space Council, but it was a deliberative one. Um, and it was eventually put out on the website. Um, and I just have it here for your reference. Um, and it was developed actually out of the committee I co-chair with Eric Stalmer, who Eric uh, was the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation while I was president and CEO of, um, of the uh, Coalition for Deep Space Exploration. And we co-chair um, still an economic development and industrial-based subcommittee on the UAG and generated a paper, um, which then got inputs from a lot of other members of the UAG about um, the creation of a strategic in-space propellant reserve that was modeled on the US strategic petroleum reserve, the terrestrial one. And as part of looking into all of that, we started to learn some things about folks that were actually talking about developing commodities markets um, for in-space resources, um, their, the entire value chain associated with them. I just point this out because this thinking is going on and it's happening. The fact that the discussion occurred inside the UAG and has occurred at some other places tells you that it's beginning to enter into this sort of policy domain um, to begin have conversation, conversations about it. And certainly Congress has been very interested in ISRU um, for some years now, and they're still talking about doing yet another bill on it. Um, and the executive orders that were issued in the last couple of administrations, okay, have touched on ISRU. So it's beginning to become more and more a topic that people are discussing policy about. It's also reflected in the Artemis Accords um, that came out uh, last year. Um, having to do with um, essentially, you know, going to the moon and then how uh, we're going to sort of deal with resources there. So it is showing up in a lot of different places now, but it's still a long way away. And so I just, I just kind of want to um, point that out. So just kind of finishing up my last few slides here, and then we can go to discussion, um, talking about a commercial case in point. Um, this is a, as a, um, um, just a, a, a drawing of, um, of uh, Axiom Station um, with its first couple of modules and its uh, research and development module, as well as the Earth Observatory um, attached to the space station. So Axiom, as mentioned before by Ken, is the world's first commercial space station. Um, in, uh, in 2020, Axiom was awarded exclusive rights by NASA um, out of a competitive, it was a competitive award. It, we competed with uh, several other companies um, to have that right to basically attach its own module to a berthing sport on the ISS. And so the mission is to make low earth orbit accessible to governments, researchers, manufacturers, and individuals. And um, once the ISS end of life um, comes. So I've been um, on record, uh, actually along with Bill Gerstmeyer um, in several congressional hearings and, and other forums basically arguing that you know, the ISS is a, a massive investment by the United States and other nations. Um, it served as a center point to international relations in space. It's actually onboarded over a hundred countries that have flown payloads or people, mostly payloads, um, or learned how to do start doing some business in space, which is an ex extraordinary achievement. Um, it represented incredible cross-cultural work. I was personally involved in it. Um, in trying to pull together, reach cross cultures and languages and, um, and all the rest of that. It operates under an existing intergovernmental agreement, which has been called by Jeff Mamber of NanoRacks, the Magna Carta of Space, um, which sort of set up the basis upon which nations and eventually it's been sort of extended to companies also, okay, would be able to operate, um, operate in space. But the ISS is an aging vehicle. 
um, it will reach an end of life. And, um, and we don't want to leave low earth orbit, essentially, um, NASA needs uh, capabilities in low earth orbit, commercial entities need capabilities in low earth orbit, researchers need capabilities in low earth orbit, etc. And so what are we going to do? And Axiom Station is, is an answer uh, to that to essentially be a follow on station. So Axiom can it, the work that Axiom is doing can basically be broken into three into three phases, just at a very high level. Um, phase one is missions to the ISS, which begin in February of 22. Our first private astronaut crew is in training right now. Um, it's being commanded by Michael Lopez Alegria, who was a former commander of the ISS, a former NASA astronaut, um, and is very excited about going back into space and can't say enough about his his uh, his his new crewmates. Um, Axiom offers private and professional astronaut missions to the International Space Station. And part of our doing this is because, well, first of all, it generates revenue. But the second thing it does is it allows us to start shaking down with NASA how it is that we're going to conduct private and professional astronaut, by professional astronaut, I mean astronauts from other nations, um, how we're going to conduct those missions. And it's a way for Axiom to learn and for NASA to learn uh, for how it is that we're going to do joint operations. So everything from um, you know, sort of medical certifications to how you build operations to uh, ground air communications to, I mean, all those things that are involved, you know, a technical level, operational level um, are all being developed sort of through these missions. Um, Axiom is the only private company that's right now providing NASA level astronaut training for flights to the ISS. And uh, so, as I mentioned, we have the first crew um, and this is them on a parabolic flight. Um, you know, doing some training and obviously having a lot of fun. Um, you know, we have, uh, it's an international crew um, with uh, individuals from Israel, the United States, Canada, um, and then and then Mike. Um, so the first date right now is, again, as mentioned, February 22. And then we have three uh, missions that are actually, we're in the process of developing those right now. And these are the notional dates of September 22, March 23 to September 23. And I've got a caveat there, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, which is that um, actual launch dates can vary depending on a lot of different variables. And so these, these dates I'm giving you are just really for discussion purposes, but, but that's the idea. Um, the second phase of Axiom's development is that we'll launch modules and start attaching to the ISS. So the first one is scheduled to go up in uh, 2024. The shell of it's being built right now um, by Thales Elenia, who, as you know, also developed uh, modules for the space station, um, is also working with Northrop Grumman on the Lunar Gateway. Um, and then uh, in the first two modules, their hubs are basically built so that there's room for crew quarters for four people, and then also a small research and development area um, in each one of the hubs. And the first two hub modules are essentially clones of each other. So they, look, they, they basically look the same. Um, and they'll be launched in 24 and 25. And then late in 25, we'll launch what is essentially a research and manufacturing module. And so those of you that are familiar with, um, with space history um, may recognize some of this Max Faget um, basically had a concept for a, um, an orbiting module that would be focusing specifically on uh, manufacturing. This one's human tended or human operated, um, but it's finally sort of recognizing uh, seeing that happen from a private perspective. And then finally, the Axiom Power and Thermal Tower will be added in 2027 or early 28. And up until that point, um, Axiom's modules will draw their needed resources from the ISS. So as you maybe have noticed of late, the ISS has actually been, uh, the program has been sending up new solar arrays, uh, which are there to basically supplement the existing solar arrays, which are aging, but also because the new solar arrays add power um, to the space station. And so there will be sort of additional power kit drawn from that, as well as the capability to do thermal control and um, avionics uh, interface between the Axiom modules and the station um, avionics. So that'll all sort of be working um, up through when Axiom launches the power and thermal tower, which is essentially the Axiom version of a service module. Um, and that'll launch in 27 and 28. And then once that happens, at some point thereafter, um, Axiom will be capable of detaching from the ISS and becoming a free flyer. And the way it's being designed, okay, you can kind of see this from this, this uh, notional drawing here, the way that it's being designed is it can continue to expand. So um, as part of the thinking going forward, for example, other entities may want to develop their own modules. Um, the modules also can separate from each other and become free flyers themselves away from the Axiom station. 
Um, so that provides them with some utility, for example, for certain missions where they might not want to be fully attached. Um, so it's being built to have a modular design and also to be as flexible in operation um, as we can possibly make it. So this next slide, which I'm hoping will operate correctly, will give you just sort of a, a slide by slide buildup of the assembly sequence. See if this works. So those first two modules that came on board were the hubs that I discussed, right? And then this module right here is the um, research and development and manufacturing module. And then these are some capabilities. And then you have here this, um, this earth observation module. This thing's magnificent. Um, the first panel actually, um, I saw it after it was developed and it was under vacuum at, Ax at Axiom for, I don't know, something like six weeks. Um, never budged, uh, performed brilliantly. And it was actually the first design of it, which is, um, as you all know, it's a little unusual <laughs> um, to have sort of perfect um, performance so far in testing um, with the first design. Um, but this is going to be absolutely extraordinary because these panels are eight foot um, and they will allow people to basically just have sort of essentially a 360 view um, and down uh, from, from the Axiom station. And we can put sensors out there and, and a number of other things as well. So finishing up here, future developments in space policy, here's just some areas of interest. Um, basically, uh, space debris, risk management, and re remediation, and I, I'm not going to go into it, but I'm sure you're paying attention, right? There's a lot of issues with this. Um, there have been recent UN recommendations on space sustainability that have touched on debris. Um, again, talking to the Senate Commerce folks yesterday, they are talking now about, you know, realizing we probably need to get a bill in place. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in this commercial resource development through ISRU, which I mentioned before, evolution of space law. And I'm not going to sort of get into all of this, but the Artemis Accords, which I will refer you to NASA's website if you want to learn more about them, builds on a lot of previous law, um, as well as treaties and, um, and recent uh, national space policies, and not just the current one, as well as existing NASA partnerships. And then in national security and intelligence issues kind of going forward, um, this is a huge issue. Uh, cyber is a huge issue. Um, there is no aspect of US military operations right now that do not have a space component. Um, and then of course there are in space assets too, uh, and a lot of concern about that, um, which is touching everything. How do we handle remote, remote sensing, for example? How, did, how do we better capitalize on commercial capabilities, but also protect government assets? Um, and so there's just a lot of issues to be played out. So if, if anyone is interested in a career in space policy, um, all I can do is tell you there's going to be a lot of opportunity um, going forward because the whole field is expanding as opposed to contracting. So I'm going to stop right here. And thank you for your time. I think I've talked longer than I expected to, but um, I can open up to questions. Yeah, thank you so much. This is just amazing. Uh, There's a wonderful very inspiring and very insightful. This is what people are looking for for a very, very long time. Uh, you provided the best, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, insight into this issue. Uh, so hi, everyone. This is really a wonderful opportunity. So uh, please, you know, uh, raise your hand, you know, quick raise hand and be able to speak directly to a speaker and uh, uh, speak out your question. I see uh, Gus. Gus, you, you posed a question. Do you want to speak out, Gus? Go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Mary Lynn, congratulations. You've covered, this is a wonderful presentation. You've covered a lot of territory here, all the way from uh, U.S. government space policy to uh, emerging industries. So I have a couple of questions regarding that. The first one is, with the national security issues that appear to be pumping up nowadays with large countries with space capabilities such as Russia, China, India, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and others. Do we have, does the U.S. have a multilateral agreement as to the do's and don'ts regarding flying over their national territory? And the second question is regarding the, the advent or the emerging industries that are coming up as a result of commercial space industries and the technology that is available in space, where did you see the U.S. as a as a as a country uh, from a, from a national policy? What do you see that the U.S. driving towards from a from an economic growth or from an emerging industry um, uh, capability growth perspective? So that's a second question. Thank you. 
Sure. Um, so thanks, Gus, for the question. First, with regard to a multilateral agreement, no. Um, what we have, so there's higher treaty level agreements um, that which aren't necessarily treaties, but they're meaning higher level, um, basically among governments. And we agree, so we've negotiated those along with many other nations. So when you say multilateral, um, for example, there are groups of nations that, have, well, most nations actually have agreed to, um, to uh, abide by keep out zones. So there's keep out zones where um, the U.S. has agreed that it's not going to do surveillance from space, okay, over certain zones, or it's not going to do communications over certain zones. And so it agrees generally with its allies, um, you know, with regard to that. And so, but but in general, what tends to happen is that is that the U.S. tends to end up in bilateral discussions um, with a lot of these company, countries as to how it is that, is that we're going to operate. Um, some of those bilateral discussions also end up with pretty heavy scrutiny, um, both from the executive branch and from congressional branches. Um, and there are, there, there are laws, um, I wanna mention the Wolf Agreement, uh, the Wolf um, Amendment, because it's often misreported. Um, so for example, uh, with regard to a range of space activities, um, certainly all of those encompassed by NASA, um, there's, a, there's a Wolf Amendment, which is often reported as prohibiting bilateral activity um, between NASA and China. And that's not true. It doesn't prohibit bilateral activity. It's a notification requirement so that NASA has to go to Congress if it's preparing to do something like that, okay, to work with, with, work with China, for example, notify it, have a conversation with Congress about sort of what's the justification for doing this and sort of Congress can nod or not nod. Okay, but, but it's and actually sort of, it's a, it's a, it's a notification requirement. Um, so what tends to happen was with a lot of these countries, especially the ones that you mentioned, um, and in particular with countries that are on the, what we call the designated countries list. Um, and those are countries that have developed, essentially, this is really about military capability um, or intelligence capability. Those countries that have developed certainly um, intercontinental capability, uh, we have a, a different set of arrangements and discussions with them um, that are bounded differently than the ones that we that aren't on the designated nations list. Um, so essentially, there's just a, there's a whole you're pulling on something that's really great here um, because there's just an entire universe um, of complexities having to do with the nature of those relationships. But there are high level ones um, where many countries have sort of agreed to work together. So that's about as far as I can go there. And then with regard to your second question. Um, the U.S. is way ahead of uh, everybody um, when it comes to the emergence of, of commercial space, and and I want to point out to to I want to point out something about this. Um, the original Organic Act, the 1958 Act, um, encouraged the United States to develop capabilities, um, basically to operate in in outer space. Subsequent authorization acts, which you know have made of sort of or basically all amended of amendments of that first one, um, encourage the commercial use of space. Um, and so it's been an authorization act for some time. Um, and then there have also been standalone acts, like there was the Commercial Space um, Act of I can't remember the entire title of it. I should know it of 2015, uh, which was essentially the Commercial Launch Act, which really really kind of pushed forward the commercial launch industry. And so there've been a lot of there's been help that's come. Um, from Congress and also from the executive branch for a long period of time. But at the very early days where NASA was, NASA was beginning and also other capabilities were beginning, there was always thinking ahead about how investment in development of government capabilities would eventually transfer to the private sector because that's how the United States system works. And so the fact that you have these capabilities and you know, I've actually appreciated, um, Elon Musk has said repeatedly, um, that SpaceX is built on the shoulder of giants, right? It was the capabilities and the knowledge that was sort of developed inside NASA and other areas, because NASA, of course, is, is also the child of dual use technologies, right? They were originally developed for the, on the military side. Um, but, but basically those capabilities that were developed were eventually um, able to sort of transfer into the private sector. So you have this wonderful virtual cy virtuous cycle where capabilities were developed in the government side, eventually transferred and iterated in by the private sector, which then was able to do innovation and sort of bring forward new capabilities built on those capabilities. And the fact that the United States has the system that it does, okay, where you have this interaction between industry and government, 
um, has been the allowed the thing that sort of allowed a lot of that to happen. Um, and then, of course, since those, a lot of things have happened too, right? Cost of transaction, transactional costs have gone through the floor with the advent of computing technologies. You don't have to do this by slide rules and handwritten records anymore, right? And that's become so cheap relative to what we used to be able to do that now a lot of people, okay, who have brains and capability and um, an initiative, all right, and uh, and and if, if sort of really thought carefully about how do I capitalize on this stuff or how do I innovate on it? I've got this problem I need to go solve. How do I go solve that problem? Now have the tools to be able to do that. And some of those tools came out of the space program too, not all of them, um, but some of them did. So we actually have this virtual cycle that's been working in the United States now for decades. And as a result of that, okay, we are far ahead of the world. That said, the world's catching up as it always does. When you have technology that starts to proliferate around the world, um, you have, you know, people playing catch up and a particular concern to me and some others, okay, is that China has been paying very close attention to what's happening with our virtuous cycle over here. And since 2008, okay, um, they have been putting more and more money into development of private and commercial technologies, um, which are really still definitely um, still funded by the government. Um, but they're beginning to adopt a lot of those capabilities. And since 2013, um, there has yearly been investment from the government and changes in policies to sort of facilitate the development of this stuff. And they're coming on uh, quickly. So, um, so I think you know one thing we need to be sensitive to, okay, is that while we're way ahead and while that emergence has had just huge impact, as I said, on the space, on space programs, space policies, um, capabilities and, and opportunities for development of new, of new economies, um, which is all tremendous. There, there are still um, there are there are other countries that are sort of watching and learning, right? From from what it is that we're doing, and we need to we need to stay cognizant of that as well. Okay, so uh, next, uh, Madhu, Professor Sankavenu. Uh, uh, Marilyn, thank you for a thank you for a, a very illuminating um, one hundred and one talk on on policy, uh, space policy. Now. Uh, um, I have two or three questions, but uh, let me ask you the first one, which is uh, in the law, in the law, does the international law uh, precede national uh, <laughs> domestic law? Precede it? Or does it override? What, what, what is the bigger bigger fish. Okay, so um, I, I'll first start by saying I am not an international space law expert. Um, so I, I'm going to caveat uh, what I'm going to say next <laughs> through that. Um, but what I am going to say is that it is it is in general been the approach of the United States, not just with regard to space law, to advocate for what it wants to see Okay, in I'll just talk about space, um, in space policy and space law to negotiate treaty or treaty level agreements with its own interests in mind, which of course, I mean, I would argue any nation should do. Um, and to only subscribe to the development of treaties and international law and agree to adhere to it when it believes that it's in the interest of the United States to do so. Now, let me quickly caveat that by saying that doesn't mean that the United States is always saying it's our way or the highway. That does not mean that the United States is unwilling to take into account the interests of other nations. If you look at the way that the, for example, work has been implemented on the International Space Station, okay, it's pretty clear that, um, that we have sort of found our way um, to, to working with other nations. And so that, and we were actually, we've been doing it kind of from the beginning. Um, and we've certainly done it in space science, which is a whole other area I didn't get into because policy is formulated a little bit differently there. Um, but we've been doing international work there, for, you know, just for, for many, many, many years. So, um, so I would say that it is a complex interplay, right? Um, and depending on the administration and the Congress, you see varying levels of assertiveness with regard to US interests. So for example, that, that quick little example I gave you of approaches to national security issues in space, you know, between George Bush, uh, George W. Bush, um, Obama and Trump. 
okay, um, showed you sort of the difference in perspectives where um, the Bush one was sort of a really a hegemony, right? It's, it is our way, the highway. It was really kind of what they were saying. Okay, the Obama administration was saying it's our way, but we'll consider opportunities, okay, to, you know, collaborate as long as we think they're equitable and all the rest of that. So still the United States is the arbiter, all right? And the Trump administration was saying, um, we think that our, us and our allies ought to be able to use space, but here's how we're going to respond if we feel like we're threatened, okay? So these are three different approaches, and each one of them have implications for treaties, um, and for law is eventually passed by the US Congress. So, but it really, it just has to do with what the United States has agreed to subscribe to. So for example, we subscribed to the Outer Space Treaty. We did not sign the Moon Treaty. Yeah. And the reason we did not sign the Moon Treaty is that we did not believe it was in our interest to sign the Moon Treaty. Right. So the Moon Treaty exists, okay? And it's not that it exists completely in a vacuum. It has influenced law. Yes. But we did not sign on to it. That's right. So now, uh, um, you know, the Artemis Accords, um, while I thought it was framed well and put across to potential partners, um, it seems to have raised uh, um, a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot, let's put it mildly, a lot of discussion in the world community about what it is that the U.S. intends to do. Um, so, you know, when I look at the national space policy over the years, it clearly adheres to our philosophy of governance, which is really uh, anchored on free world values. And uh, this comes to us even from as early as that beautiful portrait of Eisenhower that you put up, you know, hey, no, we don't want any fights, we don't want any wars, but, but we want freedom in space. And that rings throughout. Now, um, let me ask you a pointed hypothetical. Uh, we landed uh, uh, several assets on the lunar surface, uh, particularly the first uh, human landing uh, on uh, the Sea of Tranquility. Now, if we wished to take care of the Apollo 11 assets on our moon, and we wish to engage a series of operations to do that, both unmanned and crewed, will that in any way interfere with international law or international aspirations? Can they cause trouble? So as you know, there has been a law passed um, that basically calls for the preservation of historical sites on the moon. Um, and that it was signed into law. Um, the, the, the interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty is that the assets that belong to a nation, okay, in outer space belong to a nation in outer space. So those assets that are there, okay, on the moon um, are considered to belong to the United States. And should the United States, okay, and the United States now has passed a law that basically says, should the United States decide to basically go to try to preserve those assets, essentially then, then that just basically stakes out that territory and says, that's what we're gonna go do. Where the debate starts to come in is, well, those assets are sitting on territory. They're literally, literally on a ground. They're sitting on regolith, right? Um, on a planetary body. And under OST, under some interpretations of OST, we certainly do not own, okay, that, piece of the moon. It's not like somebody has like sort of staked out a square around those assets and said, okay, that's, all, that's ours, but the assets are ours. So, and everybody agrees that the assets are ours. There's no debate about that. So it would depend upon how, okay, we, we go about doing that. And where you start to look at, and I actually haven't heard this question specifically about application of the Artemis Accords to the Apollo 11 assets, but if I think about the Artemis Accords and sort of what it is that they're saying, and I, I and I, I think they were very carefully crafted um, to try to build upon, and this is a great example of example where there was input from State Department, there was input from the legal community, there was input from NASA, there was input from, I mean, you know, number of, of, of entities that were involved in, in crafting this. Um, and I think it was well crafted. If you look at that, then basically what they're saying is, look, we're going to notify if we if we adhere to the Artemis Accords, okay, and, and the way those are being structured, 
um, is that there's a framework for them, but then the actual implementation of them is negotiated bilaterally, which goes back to your early question about multilateralism. Okay, they're actually negotiated bilaterally. And so if we were going to go and op, do op, engage in operations around Apollo 11 to preserve those assets, okay, we would notify those partners who have signed on to, we probably notify, we would, we would, I'm guessing, probably notify more, okay, but we would notify those partners that with whom we have agreements, okay, under the Artemis Accords, um, that we were going to go do that. We would tell them what it is that we we're going to do, okay, and then we would be transparent, okay, about those operations um, and, you know, continue to sort of advise people what it is that we're doing. Now, can I speak to how other nations are going to respond to that? No. Has okay. everybody signed on to the Artemis Accords? No. We're no. just in the process of beginning to build those bilateral arrangements, right? We've, we've got several company, countries now that have signed on, but certainly not others have, right? So can I predict, you know, what's actually going to happen on the surface of the moon? No. What I can say is that there's broad international agreement that we own the assets. Excellent. Uh, you know, it, this opens up some very interesting discussions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for those comments. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Al Globus. Al, Al, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, I have uh, three, three questions. The first is, what is your view of space solar power? The second is, has Axiom run afoul of ITAR? And the last one is, are there other laws that are mischaracterized uh, in, the, in the media? Ooh. <laughs> okay, so my view of space, are you asking my view of space solar power from a policy perspective? Yeah, I'm talking about, I'm, in this case, I'm talking about energy gathering in space and, and beam to earth. Okay, so I think there's technical challenges. We'll set those aside. Mm -hmm. um, from a policy perspective, we don't have a framework for it yet. The only discussions that, not really, the only discussions that have got application to it are those that have to do with ISRU, which is interesting, right? Because everybody thinks about ISRU as kind of digging something out, essentially, or pulling something out of an atmosphere. But collection of space power, radi solar radiation, okay, collection of solar radiation, okay, is essentially, it's a, it's a resource, the resource exists in space, okay, there's a means to sort of collect that resource, right? Um, and, then a re and then eventually, we hope, a means to sort of disseminate or distribute it. So right now, from where I sit, okay, what I would say is that as we're continuing to develop a framework for ISRU um, and assert rights and uses of, of resources, that seems to me just to be the easiest, and, and I don't mean that it's easy, <laughs> um, but, it, but what we always try to do in space policy is look around for, okay, well, what frameworks already exist, right? What law already exists, what treaties already exist, but you know, what's the framework we, that we can plug things into um, rather than create things from whole cloth, because that's a painful, long, arduous process that can take decades. Okay. And so the ISRU one is probably the one right now from where I'm sitting that is most applicable to, to space power. Um, and I would, you know, it would be great, um, hint, hint, uh, to see some people sort of talking to the Hill about, you know, Hey, look, how can we think about what we're doing with ISRU as it would apply to space power? Um, so that's that's one thing. Tell me your other questions. Oh, yes. Yeah, so if Axiom had run a, far, a fall of ITAR, no, not yet. And then what was your question? Last question. Sorry. The uh, last question was uh, you you uh, indicated that the, the law regarding relationships with uh, China uh, was mischaracterized. Yeah. And I was wondering if there are other laws that are badly mischaracterized in the in the media. <sighs> Well, nobody knows what the Outer Space Treaty says. <laughs> I mean, there are a couple, there are a couple of people who do, um, and the there have been some pretty good articles sometimes on the there are there are genuine debates, okay, as there always are with regard to law and treaty, um, and should be. I mean, personally, I'm I'm one of those people who welcomes those debates because I think we learn from them. Um, but but there have been genuine you know sort of debates over the last few years, in particular about applications of it, and it's just hard to find good captures of that because. Because, you know, honestly, you have to get some subject matter expertise associated with it, right? And I'm sympathetic to people who are trying to cover it. It's hard. Um, and so I think that that's been the initial announcement, for example, the Artemis Accords um, was really mishandled. Um, and, and I'm not pointing at anybody in particular, but, um, but it was mischaracterized, and particularly in the international press. And so what started to happen was that you got 
um, you got countries that were that began to respond to the press reports, right? Um, before there was an opportunity for the U.S. government to engage with them and sort of say, no, no, you know, th this is what it actually says and what it actually does and, and kind of how it is that we're thinking about the application of all of this. And so it was unfortunate because, um, and, and actually had NASA come, I think Mike Gold commented on it a couple of times, that it was unfortunate that that had kind of broken the way that it did um, because they had people who were sort of understandably responding to it the way that they were and, it, and, and you needed to kind of then backtrack and it's hard to backtrack. Um, it, it can be done and it is done frequently, but, but, it, but it's hard to do. I think, I think whenever we start talking about, um, I, I think space policy in general is, is hard to communicate. I mean, I tried to do, I'm not sure how good a job I've done here, but I tried to do sort of a overall you know, of it here. But I hope one of the takeaways for you all is it's really complex and it's just built on um, an understanding of how Congress works and how the executive branch works and how they work together or don't, um, you know, sort of how treaty happens, how law evolves. Um, all the rest of that. And so I think it's just tough to do. With regard to questions about a specific law, Al, none's coming to mind, but I'll probably think of one about two o'clock in the morning. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a great talk. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, okay, uh, next, uh, Dr. Dwight Holland. Dr. Holland, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Dimmer. Thanks for a great talk. Appreciate it. Um, I'm actually living in Roanoke, Virginia now, which isn't far from you if you're in North Carolina. In the Blue Ridge Mountains, it's a great place to live. I, I know where Edwards. Roanoke is. Yeah. Yeah, I worked at Edwards for a long time in the Air Force uh, at the at the test pilot school, and then worked with NASA. Some, but my question is: this audience has a lot of uh, technical, broad and deep technical background and systems management type of background, aerospace and and others. And so, if if some folks in this audience were really interested in becoming more attuned or able to work in the commercial space world on the policy side or the higher level systems management side. Um, I know there's a lot of pathways, but do you have any thoughts on what pathways might be the best for them in term, terms of either work experience, education, or training to kind of tilt toward that management and policy side in this new world of commercial space? Um. You know, that's a question I should have thought about going into this and I didn't. Um, so good question. Um, you know, there I know there are some universities that have been offering some stuff, um, you know, for a while. Um, I know International Space University has been trying to look at all this stuff from an international perspective, including the emergence of commercial space for a while. Um, there is the New Space Journal, which is edited by my good friend Ken Davidian as the editor in chief. Ken's been with FAA for a long time and um, did his PhD actually on sort of competing models for um, economies in space and market development in space. Um, and you know, taking New Space Journal is, is a good way because uh, it, it has a range of different types of articles, has a is a good way to sort of learn both about kind of what's happening in commercial space, but also sort of understand some of the policy implications. Um, as a systems engineer, I gotta say, program management is program management is program management. Um, you know, the only thing it differs is essentially kind of what your reporting requirements are and, and, and what the sort of regulatory framework is that you're operating under. But essentially, you know, it still comes down to, um, you know, revenues, whether those revenues are being generated through investment um, or through, you know, activity, you know, sort of you know, program implementation or, um, you know, what you're bringing to the market. Um, and, but one thing I think that does differ is sort of, uh, if you've been in a government um, program, program progress for a long period of time, um, you know, the government has ways of operating because it's, it most, not all, okay, most programs have operated under the FAR um, for a long period of time. If you're in commercial space, you may still be playing with the FAR, you know, depending on, on what it is that you're doing, but you're probably under part 15, okay, which has significantly less burdensome um, regulations and reporting requirements and financial reporting requirements um, than does the sort of the rest of it. Um, and so literally just sort of being able to learn how to, you know, think about business. Um, all companies think about business, but if you're in a government program, of course, because you have to return to your shareholders or you know, or your investors, whether you're public or private. Um, but but it's but it is different. You know, I've started three companies plus a not for profit, um, and the 
the, the way that I had to operate in terms of look ahead and thinking about having a, maybe a 60 day window or a 90 day window, you know, before I had to be worrying about how does that was doing, you know, and what, what was I saying to investors and how did I, you know, what was I delivering for investors and how do I prepare it for investors? Um, you know, a lot of that sort of is at MBA level. Um, and so just getting a better understanding of how entrepreneurialism works, I think can be useful. But on another level, I'll tell you, program management and project management, they're every bit as valuable um, in commercial space as they are in more traditional government programs. You know, budget, schedule, risk, <laughs> um, they're all, those things are all still transferable. And, yeah. and maybe, maybe night clashes in the law too. Sure. Um, <laughs> and they're really things. When, interestingly, when I was in Antarctica and a long time ago, there was a person who had um, gotten to go to McMurdo that was a, a, a lawyer, and they were very interested in this emerging field of space law because of the Antarctic Treaty and the relationships. And so it is sort of a complex intertwining of law, business, management, and all of those pieces. Thank yeah, you. It really is. You're welcome. Uh, next, Paula. Uh, Paula used to work in NASA and she's writing an epic science fiction. Awesome. Paula, go ahead. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. We were talking about the whole internet aspect of um, in space. I worked at Brown University for a few years in the 1980s. And during that time, I learned that Brown University scientists had been working with Russian scientists for many years. Um, and while I was there, Dan Golden came to um, put his blessing on a new downloading capability, downloading and uploading it re related to Brown work Russia. Um, and I thought this was rather remarkable at the time and very positive. So I, I see that as kind of a beginning. I don't know of any other situations like that at that time. Um, and so do you, do you think that we have advanced in terms of working together? Um, you know, we have a lot of issues with China, I know. We've been working very well with the Russians on the space station for 20 years. Um, how, how would you talk about address international relations relative to our working together? and being productive sure. versus so, competitive. Well, yeah, and I have to tell you, I, I like both um, competition and collaboration. Um, and, and, I, and I think they're both valuable. Um, I think collaboration is valuable and that may be sort of a, you know, it's coming from a US, um, certainly US centric, uh, US cultural, acculturated um, position. And I completely acknowledge that. Um, you know, collaboration has been certainly in the sciences, um, has been just a, a hallmark and it's, and it's been a hallmark in space science. Um, you know, it's, it's tremendous. I mean, you know, the, the, the point that you're sort of talking about in, um, in, uh, in the eighties, but there was earlier, uh, collaboration actually having to do, you know, having to do with space science. I mean, one thing we kind of forget sometimes is the international geophysical year of 1957, um, is actually kind of what kicked off everything there. And of course the Russians launched Sputnik um, in 57 to which the United States responded very strongly. Um, and then, you know, we started launching probes uh, the following year, um, but it wasn't, but, but, but scientists were talking across international boundaries um, actually through the sixties and, and into the seventies. And, so, um, and so that's, that's actually been present in a, in a part of space for a long time, as it has been more broadly uh, having to do with science. I think that we're, I think that we have progressed tremendously. I mean, the station for me is um, probably just because it's really, I mean, where I started. I mean, I started um, doing, developing research and development applications and capabilities for the space station and went on to manage um, the group that was responsible for developing the procedural flows for assembly activation and checkout um, for Boeing, which I did for about half the assembly flights. And then later I was an advisor to the International um, Space Station National Laboratory and station is kind of the red thread running through my career. I mean, I've left it and come back to it and left it and come back to it um, in a lot of different settings that I'm sort of back to it again now, you know, sort of, sort of through Axiom. 
Um, and it's stunning. I mean, we take it for granted, but um, there's been discussion for 20 years about nominating the ISS for the Peace Prize. And it seems to me that's just, this is just such a duh. Um, you know, the collaboration that went on between the United States and Russia at a time where on the Russian side, Russians had difficulty communicating even internally. So, you know, you would try to get specifications for parts or for um, aspects, you know, they flew space stations successfully for decades. Um, they are the past masters of space stations, right? And so, you know, trying to learn and them, but their challenges they face, trying to dig down into their own system when everything had been compartmentalized and, um, and hidden and coded and, um, and all the rest of that, and all of that that had to be worked through um, as well as just sort of decades long distrust in some cases, um, you know, that, that was worked through and worked through successfully. And the partnership, everybody points to the partnership of the last 20 years since the station became operational. Well, yes, but that partnership was going on and in place and, and working through a tremendous struggle, um, prior to becoming operational. Right. So, um, so I think, I think that certainly if you go back to the Apollo days, although even, even during Apollo, right, there were conversations about perhaps a joint program to the moon. Um, okay. But um, I think if you go back to the Apollo days and then you look forward, um, station has just been pivotal. Um, and, and then I would argue also that space station, um, the IJA was not really appropriate to extend to the moon, but it was the inspiration under the I, of the IGA and its successful um, application to station and then everything that it's kind of given birth to that actually sort of spurred people forward to start saying, okay, we need a new set of, of, of thinking about how it is that we're gonna do this because we wanna engage the world. We want our allies you know, to be working with us. And so, yeah, I do think there's been, especially if you look back over 50 years, I think there's been tremendous progress. So just on that, do you think we can have develop that kind of a relationship with the Chinese? We need to have some sort of, we do have a relationship with the Chinese and we need to have some sort of relationship with the Chinese. But now you're asking me to predict geopolitics, and I don't know. <laughs> uh, Marilyn, uh, am I right to think that um, Chinese scientists and NASA have been collaborating? Yes, that's why I said we do have a relationship. Yes, yes. All right, I, I think. Uh, uh, this is really amazing presentation. And we have actually way more questions uh, lined up, but I know we don't want to keep you forever, but just a wrap up. Uh, uh, you mentioned about this uh, uh, Congress as the main authority for space policy. So the kind of last two, last question was that, do you think that uh, Congress has enough people to work on this? And the second is how, what would you advise or recommend AIAA, uh, what AIAA should do or could do? Uh, to help out more for the space policy. So let me clarify just a little bit. Um, I think that the, I think Congress and the executive share responsibility for space policy. The Congress, however, writes the laws. And so space policy has generated, you know, especially if you look at the last administration, right, the series of space policy directives that were issued by the White House. Some of them have been, some of them reflected work that was already going on at Congress. Some of them reflected things that were already in law. Some of them provided guidance to Congress to sort of adopt into law. Um, so, so there's an interplay, right, between the two branches. And I wanna be clear to that. It's just that if Congress writes a law, then it's the law and the law is binding upon the executive branch. Okay, so, so just, just kind of be clear about that. Um, does Congress have enough people working on this? Well, um, the US domestic policy is a pretty broad bucket. And it incorporates everything that the US government does. And so space is a small part of that, relatively speaking, in terms of both expenditures and perceptions of policy implications. It's grown, okay, of recent years because people are beginning to realize just how much, okay, of what the US does in day-to-day -day activities, certainly military activities, the growth of the commercial space industry, the revitalization of NASA's deep space program, okay, all of those things that are starting to happen now. So there are more people engaged in space now on the Hill than there were 20 years ago, certainly 10 years ago. Okay, that there's, there are definitely more people engaged in it. But do we need more? Absolutely, we need more. Um, and the best way to go about doing it is if I'm a congressional representative, my job, whether a Senator or a, a Congressperson, my job, don't forget this, is to return value to the people who elected me. 
that's my job. I mean, it was set up that way by the Second Continental Congress, okay? My job is to return value to my constituents. So when you start thinking about how it is that you're going to approach, and is my job to, to provide shepherding and guidance to the nation as a whole? Yes, but my primary job is to return value to my constituents. That's my job. So when you start thinking about approaching Congress and you start talking about advocating space, one way that you can become more effective, okay, is by thinking about how does space benefit that person? How does space benefit those constituents that that representative represents? Again, whether a senator or a congressperson. And the two things that seem to work the most are sort of just helping them connect the dots between things that are going on in space and what happens in their district or what happens in their state. And then the other thing that's helpful is sort of talking about personal stories, right? Here's how it affected me, okay? Here's how it's affected my education. Here's how it's affected my peers, okay? Here's how it affected my career, okay? Here's how it's affected jobs, okay? Here's, I mean, those kinds of things that are just really concrete. Congress people are people too. We forget it sometimes, right? Um, but they're people too, um, and they have jobs to do. So as we think about that going forward, those little things, they sound simple and simplistic, but they're, they're really are, they really are key. Um, how, do, how, does it, how, do, how does it matter when that person has to go back and have town meetings and explain what they're doing on the Hill, how does space matter? Uh, so how about the, uh, your advice or recommendation for AIWA, uh, what AIWA could do, should do to uh, help out for space policy? Well, <laughs> um, I've had these discussions with AIWA many years, over the, many times over the years. Um, my, this is just my personal, Two cents, right? Um, if you go back to the 80s, I want to say 87, but I could be wrong on the year. There was a um, brilliant publication called Rising Above the Gathering Storm from a committee on the National Academies that was chaired by Norm Augustine. And they published an update about 10 years later called Revisiting Gathering Storm. And what it did was it basically pointed out the impact of U.S. failure in um, research and development funding and STEM education. And everyone in industry and everyone in government, okay, is concerned about that. And I'll tell you, the current administration is certainly, I mean, one of the things that we've been getting, the messages we've kind of been getting from the Biden administration is we really want to think about how space uh, can be leveraged and to help, um, you know, generate funding, generate programs, generate inspiration for um, for that. And we need a diverse workforce. We need an educated workforce. We need funding for research and development. And without those, you know, basic research and development. And without those, okay, the USS, the US is absolutely going to, it is absolutely ceding its competitive edge and it will continue to compete. And all of that underpins what AIAA does. Every aspect of it, right? The technical and, and, and the technical strength of AIAA as a professional organization, I'm an, I'm an associate fellow, as was pointed out earlier. Okay, rests upon um, building that pipeline and making sure that we are generating, you know, people who have the capabilities to be able to push these, push this technology, push these applications, innovate, um, you know, execute programs. I mean, all the rest of the stuff is just absolutely critical. And so personally, I would like to see AIAA think about how it is it can leverage what it does um, and think about what it does and the needs of the people that are members of AAA, um, hundreds, you know, over 100,000, um, you know, to basically see strong, uh, strong investment in, in, from a variety of sources, not just the government, strong investment in, in education and in re and research and development. Yeah, this is amazing. We are so lucky and honored to have you. I know you're very busy. Uh, and just to let you know, you mentioned about the new space, commercial space. Every year, every April, uh, the Los Angeles Athletic Section has a new space mini conference. So we have been doing our best to promote uh, this new space activities. And we're also considering uh, not just the current newsletter, we're considering a separate publication for uh, new space or space policy or space philosophy. Uh, thanks to Madhu. Uh, so uh, uh, anything, you know, when you have time, you know, welcome the article or coming back again, you know, we'll uh, open arm for you. Thank so this you. is really amazing. We really, everybody agree. This is really the one of the best event. This is really amazing. You're really good. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we don't want to keep holding you for, for too long. We know we're very busy. So thank you so much again. So uh, uh, we're, we're here to support and cheer for you and the XM space.
Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you again for the opportunity. I really, I really enjoyed it and hope it was helpful. A pleasure. Great honor. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, being with us today. So how wonderful it was. It's an amazing day uh, with Dr. Dithma. So uh, please stay, stay tuned, stay in touch. Uh, next week is Electronic Warfare. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's another, and uh, on this um, October 12 is planetary defense, a global uh, efforts. So um, have a great day. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Enjoy the Saturday. I'll see you next time. Thank you so much again. Goodbye.